Hey guys, Josh here with Gold's Finishing. Today we're going to do something a little bit different. Um, you know, I have a pretty big presence on Quora, and that's basically, if you're not familiar with it, a website where you go and make a list of your expertise. So, like, I would have, let's say, furniture flipping, furniture innovation, refinishing, stuff like that as a credential. And people ask questions, and the more you answer, Quora kind of adjusts them based on your credentials. So, basically, I get a bunch of questions every single day on refinishing furniture and uh, flipping furniture for profit and stuff like that. So today I'm going to be using a couple of those questions. I figured on YouTube it'd be great, um, you know, especially with some of my comments on my other videos, it'll help answer some of those questions. So I'm actually going to be putting this in a playlist for everybody to see. It'll go in, I think I'll call them episodes is what we'll do. Um, I'll do little episodes and put them in a playlist for you guys to watch. Uh, they'll be like, we'll answer five questions today. And in the description box, if you don't want to skip through all the video and stuff, click the description box and you guys will be able to see all the questions that will be answered in the video. So stay tuned and hit the subscribe button, hit the like button, and let's get into it. All right, guys, so let's get into it. Uh, this is coming from me personally this is my expertise so if you know I'm off on any of this make sure to call me out don't hesitate on the comments um, you know I like to get my facts straight but I will try and answer these questions as best as possible so let's get into it let's see question number one is from Mark L he says is chipboard slash plywood stronger than real wood all right Mark so Yes and no. You know, plywood can be extremely strong. Chipboard or particle board, whatever you want to call it, can be extremely strong. And real wood can be extremely strong. You know, you have different species, different grain patterns. Um, depends on the way you put the weight on whether it's vertical or horizontal too. So I would say real wood as a general answer because real wood has what's called lignin in it and that's basically like a wheat stock or like your spaghetti um, you know you have that vertical strength in a wheat stock that makes it stand up right and it's hard to bend that lets it get all the sunlight and all the moisture to the roots if it just laid on the ground you know it wouldn't live obviously so lignin applies to trees as well and that's what gives them their structural integrity so if the tree didn't have lignin it would literally flop around like a wet noodle um, so that's something that real wood has you know particle board has the same thing because it is wood fibers but the problem is is particle board is simply wood particles mashed up and infused into an adherent compound so it's all glued together in a sense that you have multiple different grain directions facing different ways so one board you know one solid two by four has all its lignin facing one way that gives it its structural integrity now with like a plywood or a particle board you have multiple grains facing different directions so it really allows it to bend and flex and expand as well in all four directions compared to wood where I want to say tangentially which is a more like on the ingrain is where you will see the most change in form but overall I would say wood is probably your best bet um, in terms of structural integrity you know that's kind of a tough question because there's things like the new engineered beams they have for, for commercial building and even some residential, they're almost like a plywood, but they're pressure treated. And, you know, those on a certain direction are stronger than real wood beams. So they hold up a house better um, or a commercial structure. Same thing applies to like a skateboard. You ever notice how like they never make skateboards out of real wood, right? Because when you lay a board flat, and put the pressure on top, you know, your lignin might be running 
this way. Your grains are running this way. So putting pressure on top makes it pretty weak. That's why they make it out of a plywood and they have different grain directions layer by layer by layer to allow flexibility and allow strength in any direction that it takes on. So that was question number one. Let's get into question number two. This question is from Rashad. Uh, how do you make a homemade wood filler? And that's a good question. I, I would imagine there's probably some YouTube videos out there on it. But um, personally, I'm a fan of using sawdust. And what I mean by that is, let's say you have a solid wood table made of maple. Well, what's the best color to fill a gouge in, in maple, right? The actual maple itself, correct? So what I do is during my sanding process, you kind of brush off or use your sanding, sanding bag to kind of empty out some extra dust from that piece. You keep that aside just for a little bit. Or honestly, with, as you work with different woods, take like some little pill bottles or some little jars and put that sawdust in, in those jars to keep aside for when you're working with different projects. Um, so let's say I'm sanding this maple table, right? I want to basically fill those gouges. So as I'm sanding, I scrape that, that sawdust off to the side. And I mean particle-sized sawdust. Don't make it too flaky or else it'll really, you'll really be able to see it. Okay? So the next thing I do is... I use Type Bond 2. Um, you can use Type Bond 1, Type Bond 3. I, I think Type Bond 2 is the best in terms of adherence to wood structures. Type Bond 3 would be good too. Um, I want to believe that's more uh, uh, humi humidity resistant, uh, water resistant. So you can use that too. But I use Type Bond 2. And what you do is you put some glue down in your gouge and then you put that sawdust in there and kind of mix it around you can do you can use your finger it's fine but then what I do once I mix it around is I make sure the entire surface is covered so um, once that gouge is covered you make sure there's not really exposed glue you make sure it has a nice thick ish layer of that sawdust on top of it because what you're going to do is let it dry and Type Bond 2, I would say, they don't really have sanding times on them. They have like a dry to the touch and then a total dry time. Dry to the touch is typically 15 to 30 minutes, so it's super quick. And then like a full dry time I think is like mm, two to four hours or something like that. Um, I would wait about two hours. Um, you could probably do it sooner, but I like to wait two hours to make sure that sawdust is really adhered to the surface. So then you go through with your sandpaper, you sand it down, and when you're initially, sorry, let's go back a little bit. When you put your glue and your sawdust on the surface, make sure it's as flat as you can possibly get it. Make sure it doesn't indent and make sure it doesn't, you know, extend past the surface. Try and get it as flush as possible because what's going to happen is you're going to start sanding that surface and there's going to be, you're going to sand right through that sawdust and then you're just going to have exposed dry glue underneath that and it's going to be really noticeable. Um, so using sawdust to glue down, get it nice and flat and then try and sand it nice and smooth and you'll see some more wood textury stuff on there. So getting a natural grain is kind of tough but if you're going through with a paint Obviously that'll work really well, but you can just use a wood filler for that, like an epoxy wood filler. But if you're going to stain, using that sawdust helps kind of adhere to the stain really well instead of using some, some thin, synthetic material like an actual wood putty. They do have wood putties out there that do accept stain, but that's just my method of using sawdust. I think it's a great method, so give it a shot. I uh, hope that answered your question, Rashad. Let's go to question number three. All right, so question number three. This one's from Mary. Uh, why are so many magazine woodworking projects based on Baltic birch plywood? 
Why is it so hard to find? So, this, you know, this is something where when you're working with manufactured products, you're not typically dealing with what other people work with on a day-to-day -day basis from a hardware store or a lumber store, okay? What you're dealing with is an actual construction company or a millwork company that makes this furniture. So they obviously have specific suppliers they get their stuff from. They're not getting stuff from Home Depot. They're not getting stuff from Menards or Lowe's. So what you have to think about is their suppliers are giving them literally like the cheapest product that gives the best appearance. And Baltic Birch is one of those products that you can get for dirt cheap, um, especially the veneered products. Uh, as you see the new furniture coming out, you know, obviously it's not solid wood. So you're going to deal with a lot of Baltic Birch plywood um, or a Baltic Birch veneer, maybe cherry, maybe maple uh, as well. So those are three things that you need to look out for. Now, in terms of finding it, that may apply to different regions. And what I mean by that is with different regions, you know, you have different suppliers supplying different things. So like right now I'm in Missouri. Walnut prices are high, but Missouri Walnut is right down the road a couple hours and you know, they supply to our local dealers. So Walnut for us is pretty easy to acquire. Now Walnut, in a different region, maybe, I don't know, Southern Alaska or something, or Eastern Colorado, you know, that might be harder to acquire. Um, but yeah, Baltic Birch is kind of like your, your go-to AWI, the Architectural Woodworking Institute standard, uh, Baltic Birch or, or Maple is kind of your standard when you're, when it comes to manufacturing. So, that's kind of why you see so many projects based on it because those people might have access to Baltic birch ply or veneered products. So I hope that answers your question, Mary. Something else I thought of, uh, Baltic birch is pretty, I'd say it's fair in terms of use. Uh, it's pretty easy to work with. Uh, it's not too oily, anything like that. I would say that's probably in the furniture section of things why they would use that over maple if they decided to do that because maple can be really hard to accept stains and polys and stuff like that. So that's another reason you might see Baltic birch. But let's wrap that question up and let's go on to the next one. Number four. Uh, this one's from Jason. Is it true that a wooden table should be sanded down again every few years to maintain that new and shiny look. All right, Jason, so that depends. I say that depends because, you know, it depends on what you finished it with. Now, the same applies to your floors at home as well, or your decks. You know, if you're putting an oil on there, oftentimes you don't have to put a poly on it. It protects itself. It seals the grain with the oil. It doesn't need a poly coat. You can apply a poly coat, but you don't need to. Now, when you're putting oil on, on furniture, you do have wear over time. That's something where, you know, you don't have to sand down the whole piece. That's what I like about oils. Um, I did do it on one of my convertible desk pieces I did on YouTube. You'll have to check it out. But, uh, no, so that's something where when you oil that one spot can be refinished any time. So you can, if you have wear and tear on it, you go through, sand it down, and then reapply the oil. No big deal, not a lot of sanding, honestly, especially to get that color kind of back to its normal state and then reapply. Now, if you're standing and applying poly or something like that, you can also sand down the poly with like a 220 grit or something and reapply the poly. Now, you have to be careful with stains because they are a little, diff a little bit different than oils. 
they don't blend as well. So what I mean by that is when you oil a product and then you re-oil it, it kind of blends together. When you stain it, oftentimes that's already adhered within the grains, but it's not sealing the grain, okay? So when, when you restain something, you can almost always see the line when you restain it. So in terms of staining, if you have a, a kitchen table that you stained and polyed, if it's just polyed on natural wood, you could probably stain that down and get a nice coat of poly on there and not even know it. Um, but if you have a stain on there, I would recommend, you know, you don't have to refinish the whole table, okay? But, you know, like if the legs are fine, don't worry about it. But that top, if you have that stained, I would probably recommend stripping that all the way down, applying your stain, and then recoating the poly. Just to give you the best possible appearance, of, you know, just, it'll look a lot better, alright? Um, let's see, paints. If you paint a table, and you, I, I've seen a lot of people paint tables, okay, and the main thing they forget to apply is a poly. Um, you know, you don't have to apply poly everywhere. But if you have a high sheen on that poly, you definitely need to apply it everywhere or else you're going to have legs that look matte gray and then a top that looks shiny gray, okay? But if you, you paint a table, I would highly recommend, again, to re-sand that entire surface. You don't have to sand all the paint down, maybe just down to the primer, okay? So with paint, you can probably sand that down just fine and blend those paint textures. You want to make sure it's mixed really well because you don't, you know, you don't want to use that older can from six months ago, um, not mix it well, and then try and get the same exact result in color that you did before. So mix it well, sand your table down in that area, and reapply and put that poly on, and you might get an okay appearance. But with paint, the problem is, is it's hard to tell the difference between when you're sanding the poly and when you're sanding down to the paint. Oftentimes, if you put a thin coat of poly on, you're going to sand right through it and then get to the paint. Well, if you put that paint on and it overlaps with some of the poly from a spot that you did not sand, you're going to be able to notice that easily. You're going to have paint chips and stuff over time that you're going to notice like that spot almost starts to naturally round itself out and become noticeable. So in terms of painting, yeah, I would probably sand down the whole table again, repaint and reapply. So I hope that answers your question, Jason. Uh, let's get on to number five. All right. So question number five, uh, this one's from John. Is it possible to stain wooden furniture over a previous stain, or is it better to sand everything off and start from scratch? Oh, uh, like I kind of mentioned in the last question, you know, you really want to focus on getting the best color possible. You can do all this. I mean, you can ignore it and put that little piece of stain on, sand that spot, put the stain on and put poly on and ignore it. And it'll work, the furniture will function just as good as before. But when you want a clean, clean look, the best thing you can possibly do is start from scratch. It all depends on your preference really. But stain works in a way that the grains take it in and they get pigmented from it, but it's not a true dye, okay? And what I mean by pigments and dyes, a pigment, from my understanding, is where the grains soak in that color and they hold it in within the grains. A dye is where you are literally altering the color of the grain. Stain, I believe, is a pigment. And when you're working with pigments, the problem is, is you can sand that color right out of there. Dyes are extremely hard to stain when you're working with a dot or to sand. When you're working with a dye, you could sand through the whole piece almost and never get to bare wood to where it's naturally colored. Stain as a pigment, 
basically just soaks into the into the pores and so you can sand that out pretty easily the problem is so when you're sanding you're obviously going to have issues with pressure in different areas whether you're using an orbital sander hand sander a belt sander any of those they apply different pressures on different surfaces and what i mean by that is let's say you sand down that spot to bare wood how you like it but the exterior three inches around that circle you may have just doled just a tiny bit okay and when you go back to stain it you might be able to get that bare spot like you had it before the same color as the rest of the table okay but those three inches that you kind of lightly sanded and doled that that stain a little bit if you go back through and reapply a stain you're gonna have a three inch circle around the circle you you originally stained uh, as a completely darker color because it all mixed in with the the stain that was previously in the pores that you didn't completely sand out so with stains being a pigment i would highly recommend you just refinish the table or sand it all the way down to where it was and start from scratch so i hope that answers your question john that wraps it up for this segment. I will post it here soon. We will have more episodes coming out soon. I'm going to put them in a playlist for you guys to check out. Don't forget to hit subscribe. We will see you guys later.